Hello. So this evening I'm talking to you about the illegality defence, um, which you may see in the Latin phrase ex terpi causa non orator actio, um, which means no court will lend its aid to a claimant who founds his cause of action on an immoral or illegal act. Now, this is not a modern defence. Um, <laughs> we first see it in Holman and Johnson from 1775, so the defence is much older um, than some of the situations we're going to be seeing it deployed in, so like the tort of negligence, um, which is far more modern. Um, Holman and Johnson was actually a case involving parties who were smuggling tea from Dunkirk into England. Although it's a very old defence, um, we've seen it raised in a number of different situations in the Supreme Court in recent years. And I've listed here some of the factual situations that the Supreme Court have dealt with. And you can see that the range is wide. We've had insider dealing, that's Patel and Mirza, manslaughter with a plea of diminished responsibility in the Henderson and Dorset case, um, surrogacy contracts in XX and Whittington, um, avoiding creditors, that's the Tinsley case, and Grandona um, was dealing with mortgage fraud. It should be noted that nowadays the range, perhaps we, we see so many different types of illegality in the Supreme Court because the range of illegal acts is vast, far more so than in the time of Holman and Johnson when law's dominion was very limited. Now we have regulation that covers um, most aspects of life and so potentially the range for illegal um, activity is, is far greater and could range in severity from the classic example of bank robbery um, where you're looking at bank robbers running out of a bank, jumping into a getaway car, pursued by the police. The driver is speeding, he crashes, and the issue is, can the others sue him? Or should the illegality defence prevent a claim? Um, that case would clearly involve a high level of immorality. But just as illegal is parking on double yellow lines. So if a builder, for example, parks his car on double yellow um, lines outside a house while he does a job, can the owner of the house refuse to pay him because he committed an illegal act in the performance of the contract? Common sense says no, that he should be able to be paid for his work. Um, but the difficulty for judges and lawmakers is coming up with a formula that works in all of these cases. So that will allow claims where the illegality isn't too serious, but equally won't allow claims where effectively they would be assisting a fraudster. Uh, the Law Commission considered this for years. And in fact, I actually worked there at, during part of that project, um, but never met with a solution that could be improved by Parliament. Problem being, if you get rid of the defence altogether and leave criminal activity to the criminal law, for example, then there's a suggestion that you're letting criminals get away with it um, or making a mockery of the justice system. But if you allow the defence to succeed in every case involving an element of in illegality, that could actually lead to the civil law imposing a far greater punishment than the criminal law ever would, for example, in the parking on double line, yellow line situation. Um, and that isn't the role of the civil courts. The civil courts are not there to punish anyone. The way that the courts used to deal with this um, is the reliance test that was set out by the House of Lords in Tinsley and Milligan. Now, the facts of that case were that there was a couple who'd bought a house together, but they only put it in Miss Tinsley's name because they both wanted to continue to claim benefits. So they were committing an illegal activity, which was benefit fraud. Some years later, they split up and Miss Milligan sought her share of the house. And the House of Lords held that her claim could succeed because she could show that there was a resulting trust of land without having to rely on her illegality. 
All she needed to show was that she had contributed to the purchase price and that there was a common intention between them that the property be owned equally. The equitable presumption that applied in that situation was one of resulting trust. So there was no need for her to explain um, or plead the reason that the house had only been put in Miss Tinsley's name. Now on the facts, most commentators agreed that this is the right decision. Miss Tinsley and Miss Milligan were equal fraudsters and had she not succeeded in her claim, uh, Miss Tinsley would have had an undeserved windfall because she would have been allowed to keep the entirety of the house. As it happened, Miss Milligan had in fact repented of the fraud, i.e. she'd confessed it to the DSS and she'd um, sorted things out with them in that regard, but that didn't play a part in the court's decision. The problem with this was that although the right result was achieved on these particular facts, it very much rested on the workings of the equitable presumptions and on this um, particular area of law trust law. In a different case that I've, I've noted there, tribe and tribe, we can see the problem with, with using the presumptions because in that case, a different presumption applied, which is the presumption of advancement, because that was a case involving a father um, transferring property to his child. Now, if a father transfers property to his child or a husband to his wife, equity presumes that he intends to make a gift of that property. So in order to rebut the presumption of gift, he would need to bring evidence of his reason for transferring the property, which means that he would need to rely on his illegality in order to prove his claim. So a claimant who's trying to recover back his property in a situation where the presumption of advancement applies wouldn't be able um, to get that property back, even though other than the relationship of the transferee and transferor, the situations could be identical to the Tinsley and Milligan scenario. So we can see the problems with the reliance test, mostly that it's it was unprincipled. If you were fortunate enough that you didn't have to rely on your illegality to prove your claim, then the claim succeeded. However, if you did have to, then the claim would fail. The advantage of it, however, was that it was relatively easy to advise one's client as to the application of the defence, simply looking at, well, did we have to rely on the illegality in order to prove the claim? If yes, then we've got a problem. If no, then we don't. So then coming to Stottle and Grandona. The facts of this case are quite complicated. Um, I'll, I'll try and take you through them. Um, Mrs. Grandona had an agreement with a friend of hers, one Mr. Mitchell, that she would buy his house for £90,000, the majority of which was going to be funded by a mortgage from Birmingham Midshires. But their agreement was that he would retain the management of the house, he would be the one paying the mortgage, and he would have an equitable interest in the house. She would also have an equitable interest, namely a 50% share of the profits when the house sold. The problem was they didn't tell any of this to the bank. Mrs. Grandona lied about Mr. Mitchell's continued interest in the property to um, Birmingham Midshires on her mortgage application and the fact that this was a private sale and she thereby committed mortgage fraud. The purpose of the fraud was to raise capital for Mr. Mitchell from a high street lender, which he wouldn't have been able to raise um, otherwise in his own name. They instructed solicitors, um, a Mr. Mann at Stoffel & Co. Mr. Mann acted for Mr. Mitchell, Mrs. Grandona, so the seller, the buyer, and also for Birmingham Midshires. Um, it all went ahead. The bank made the advance, um, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Mann sorry, failed to register the TR1. So that's the land registry document transferring the legal title from Mr. Mitchell to Mrs. Grandona.
In fact, he failed a number of times. The land registry wrote back to him um, and said that there was an, an error on the application. He did it again, but again there were errors um, and the application for registration was cancelled. Mrs Grondona was wholly unaware of this. Some years later, she defaults on the mortgage and Birmingham Midshires seek possession only for it then uh, only and only at that point to be discovered that she didn't have legal title at all because she'd never been registered as the legal owner. And to make things more complicated, because she'd never been registered as the legal owner, Mr. Mitchell must have been aware of this because he had actually raised more money on that property with a different lender. Um, and that lender had subsequently sold the property to satisfy the sums that he owed them. So the property is in someone else's hands, that person, that a third party, completely innocent. Um, and Mrs. Grondona has no property to offer up to the bank as, um, as security for their charge. And so she was left personally liable um, for the outstanding mortgage. So she brings a claim against the solicitors, Stoffel and Co, for negligently failing to register her interest. At some point prior to the trial, Mr. Mitchell died. So the only person who actually gave evidence in trial was Mrs. Grondona, because the solicitor uh, declined to give evidence as well. Now he had admitted negligence and causation of damage, although quantum was in dispute, um, but he raised the illegality defence. And the argument was that because Mrs. Grondona had obtained the mortgage through fraud, she shouldn't now be entitled to claim her losses. They said that she'd only instructed the solicitor to perform the conveyance in order to further her fraudulent purpose. Now, a quick note on mortgage fraud. Mortgage fraud is a serious issue and it is alarmingly common. It can range from situations where a property is undervalued and the mortgagee absconds with the mortgage money and never ever makes any attempt to repay, um, to a very common situation apparently, which is parents um, pretending that their monthly child care, child care costs are much lower than in fact they are in reality in order to get a bigger loan. So effectively they're saying that their monthly outgoings are only um, a thousand pounds when in fact their monthly outgoings are two or three thousand pounds because they're paying that amount in childcare. Um, so they get given a much bigger loan and the mortgage company is at risk. All of these things are mortgage fraud and would be criminal offences if um, there was a decision to prosecute. Now, at trial, the old law applied. So um, it was the reliance test under Tinsley. Mrs. Grondona did not need to rely on her illegality. All she needed to do was show the claim in negligence. So show that Mr. Mann owed her a duty of care, that he breached that duty in failing to register her interest and that the breach caused her loss. Namely, she didn't have a property to offer up um, to Birmingham Midshires. And so she succeeded at trial. But then very shortly afterwards, only a month or two afterwards, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Patel and Mirza. So Patel and Mirza was a restitution case involving insider dealing. Mr. Patel transferred just over £600,000 to Mr. Mirza to place bets on the movements of RBS shares. As it happened, those bets were never placed and Mr. Patel sought his money back. And the Supreme Court, and the judgment was given, by the way, by Lord Toulson, who had been the head of the Law Commission at the time of um, the Illegality Project, 
the Supreme Court disproved Tinsley and they said that the test was one of public interest, weighing up the purpose of the prohibition, public policy and proportionality. Now, because that decision came out just a few weeks after the trial in Stoffel, the defendants then appealed and they were given permission to appeal because the issue being, how does Patel apply to other areas of law? So it's a restitution case. Is it equally applicable in professional negligence? The Court of Appeal found in Mrs. Grondona's favour, um, but then they appealed again up to the Supreme Court. And the court said a number of things uh, which I'm going to go through. So first, when weighing up policy considerations, as um, the court had said should be done in Patel and Mirza, the key question is whether allowing the claim would damage the integrity of the legal system. Now this links to Professor Burroughs' works, and actually he became a Supreme Court judge shortly after um, the Grandona decision. But Professor Burroughs has been arguing this for a long time, and he's always emphasised that stultification is key. And that means that the law shouldn't give with one hand what it takes with another. So the question to ask is whether allowing the claim would result in an inherent contradiction in the legal system. So in that regard here, there were some important features. As we've seen, mortgage fraud is a crime and it's a very serious crime. It affects, uh, it's a very common prevalent crime. But denying someone a claim in the rare situation that their solicitor negligently would negligently fail to register their TR1 is such a convoluted series of events that it is highly unlikely to have any deterrent effect on anyone. You're not going to be thinking, oh, let's commit mortgage fraud. Oh no, but actually what happens if our solicitor is negligent and then I won't have a claim against him? That probably wouldn't even occur to lawyers, let alone someone who doesn't have a clue about the law. And especially in a situation where, as you've seen, it's mortgage fraud is a crime under the Theft Act, and yet the criminal law and potential criminal sanctions haven't deterred. Another important public policy behind the prohibition on mortgage fraud is the protection of the mortgagee, so the bank. Here, the Supreme Court said registration of title wasn't an essential step in the mortgage fraud. The bank had already advanced the money. So disallowing Mrs. Grondona's claim in negligence wouldn't have increased the bank's protection. If anything, it would be quite the opposite because it was in the bank's interest that she have the ability to repay the loan. In Grondona, another thing to note is she wasn't seeking to profit from the mortgage fraud, um, but she was seeking compensation for the loss caused by negligence. We're going to come back to that. Um, shortly. Only if the clear conclusion is that the defence shouldn't be allowed does the court need to go on to consider um, the proportionality element of Patel. The court also highlighted the relevance of centrality um, and in that regard said that the reliance test remains relevant to this particular issue. So if the essential facts founding the claim can be established without reference to the illegality, so i.e. the reliance test would be passed from the claimant's perspective, then the illegality is unlikely to be central to the claim. Um, and actually this reflects what Lord Sumption, who had been the dissenting judge in Patel, 
um, had said, because he described the reliance test as the narrowest test available. So if a claimant can get past the reliance test, it is unlikely that their claim will be harmful to the integrity of the legal system. That's very helpful from a practitioner's perspective, because if you have a situation where you can plead a claim without reference to the illegality, you can have a fairly high degree of confidence that any illegality defence won't succeed. Now, the title of this webinar is What does Grandona mean for property lawyers? And there are two types of property lawyer who might need to think about this case. So first, property lawyers dealing with professional negligence, whether for the claimant or the defendant, and we'll come back to this. But secondly, for the lawyer who's doing the conveyance. Now, if you are a conveyancer, first of all, don't panic. Um, Grandona has not created a new head of claim where you're somehow liable for the lost profits of a mortgage fraud. This is a simple negligence claim because Mr. Man of Stoffel failed to register Mrs. Grandona as the legal owner of the property. Mr. Mann was not a victim of the fraud in any way. Um, but it does mean that the fact of a fraud may not be a defence to a claim for negligence. This brings me to the second point, um, which was something that was raised by both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. Be alert to any potential for fraud from an early stage. It was argued on behalf of Stoffel that there was nothing to alert Mr. Mann to the possibility of fraud despite him having all the documentary evidence that was later relied on to prove the fraud. Um, but Lord Lloyd-Jones in the Supreme Court echoed what Lady Justice Gloucester had said in the Court of Appeal, namely that barring the claim would not enhance the fight against mortgage fraud and that the best way to prevent such frauds is for solicitors to be alive to and question any potential irregularities in the transaction. He found that there were factors that should have triggered warnings. Um, the first was that the solicitor was acting for purchaser, vendor and mortgagee. So he had all the information. Secondly, that Mr. Mitchell had bought the property in July 2002 and then he purported to sell it in October of that same year. So he'd only had the property for a short time. And thirdly, that the purchase price to Mrs. Grandona was three times the price that he had paid um, back in July. So all of these things, Lord Lloyd-Jones said, should have triggered um, alarm bells and alerted Mr. Mann to be um, on the lookout for any potential fraud, particularly um, as he was representing the mortgage company as well. A third point of importance for um, conveyances is that the court confirmed that equitable interests can pass under contracts that are tainted with illegality. Where property is transferred for an illegal purpose, the transferee obtains good title, uh, both in law and equity, notwithstanding that the transaction being illegal, it would not have been specifically enforced. Meaning Mrs. Grandona couldn't have demanded that Mr. Mitchell transfer her the property despite their, their earlier agreement. Um, but that doesn't matter because Mr. Mitchell had done everything he could do to affect the legal transfer. Mrs. Grandona was entitled to an equitable interest in the property, um, namely an equitable right to be registered as proprietor of the legal title. Now, the, um, the High Court recently applied this that final principle um, in the case of Victor's Estates and Monroe, um, which was a case also involving properties, um, mortgages, TR1s. Um, and in that case, a Mr. Charles owned two properties um, with two different women, one with a Miss Monroe and the other with a Miss Benjamin. 
and he forged their signatures on a TR1. The transferees knew that these were forgeries, um, but they nevertheless proceeded to borrow money on the properties. Um, and then it's the lenders who are seeking um, their security. Now, the High Court applied Stoffel and held that although the TR1s were not valid, Mr. Charles's own equitable interests had passed to the borrowers under them. So they said that although the transfer was fraudulent, it wasn't a sham and that his equitable interests would nevertheless pass, even though he couldn't pass the interests of his co-owners over, but he could pass his own equitable interests through the TR1s. So the lender's charges took effect over those interests. So the other situation where Grondona may be relevant um, is in the sort of situation that we had. So what to do if your client has committed mortgage fraud or if you're on the other side and, and mortgage fraud has been committed. So it could be a negligence claim, it could be another type of claim. First of all, look at centrality and whether the claim can be established without reference to the illegality. If it can, then the illegality is unlikely to be central and it's unlikely that any um, illegality defence will have application. So in Grandona, the Supreme Court said that the dishonest purpose um, simply provided the background to the claim for negligence. The loan had already been made and title had already passed in equity. If it is central to the claim, then consider the policy issues. Um, and from a practical perspective, again, talk to someone else. It can be really helpful to have a sounding board. When we were preparing for Grandona, the number of times there were conversations just circling around again and again, the policy issues at stake and arguing it from both sides um, and trying to work out what was more important. Um, so really useful to get someone else in as a sounding board. If the policy issues are coming down in favour of the defence, um, then at that point consider proportionality. Now, one thing to bear in mind with proportionality, with proportionality, sorry, um, profit. People generally commit fraud with the purpose of making a profit. Um, and if you are the defendant, you're likely to be arguing, well, they're seeking to make a profit here. If you're the claimant, um, don't worry. <laughs> the Supreme Court distinguished a background aim of making a profit, which obviously um, Mrs. Grandona and Mr. Mitchell did have here, from, and they said that there's a difference though between that and enlisting the court's assistance to make a profit. So you need to work out what is the claim doing? Are they, is it just, yes, that the scheme was to make a profit or is the court actively being asked to assist in this? Now here, this wasn't a claim for the profits that could have been made had the scheme succeeded. So again, if you're pleading a claim, you need to look at, well, what are we actually claiming? Um, but in Grandona, it was compensation for property lost as a result of negligence. Um, and essentially the value of the property at the time um, of the discovery of the negligence was 78,000 pounds. And that's um, what was awarded. Um, so she had that to offer up to the mortgage company. And I think that I think that she still actually owed the mortgage company something more than that. Um, but at least that was manageable. Um, and finally, I would say on this point, if you are representing a client who's committed mortgage fraud, be prepared for a frosty judicial reception um, because the instinct for any lawyer <laughs> is to say, I am not going to be assisting a mortgage fraudster and very much so for the court. Um, but that isn't what you or they are being asked to do. You're being asked to bring a claim for negligence. Um, and, that, and that that is the claim. You're not assisting, more, um, even though your client has done something criminal, 
um, you're not assisting them in, in that regard. You're assisting them in their claim. Um, now, the last thing I want to do is look at the Henderson and Dorset case. So we'll come to that next. Henderson and Dorset is a case um, involving a similar panel of judges. In fact, all the judges in Grondona were also sitting in Henderson, um, but it was a bigger panel, so there's two more judges as well. Um, and it was heard the week after Grondona um, because it involves similar issues, albeit very different facts, in that it's also a claim for professional negligence where uh, the illegality defence has been raised. But in that case, uh, the appellant, Miss Henderson, suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. She was under the care of the defendant who admitted breaches in managing her. They'd failed to respond rapidly to her deteriorating mental state. And she had stabbed and killed her mother whilst experiencing a psychotic episode. And it was common ground between the parties that, that the killing would not have happened but for um, the breaches of duty by the defendant. In that case, the claimant was prosecuted and she pleaded guilty to manslaughter um, on the grounds of diminished responsibility and was thereafter detained in a secure hospital. Um, and she claimed for damages from the defendant under a number of different headings. So first, actually, um, damages for her injury, for her pain, suffering, loss of amenity, as a result of killing her mother, um, namely she suffered from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. She also claimed for the loss of liberty caused by um, her compulsory detention in hospital, loss of amenity from the consequences of killing her mother, um, losses arising from the operation of the Forfeiture Act. So. The Forfeiture Act comes in, um, if there's any unlawful killing, you can't inherit from the person who you've killed. So this was her share of her mother's estate um, had been forfeited. And also for future losses for psychotherapy and ongoing care costs. And the defendant argued that all those heads of loss should be defeated by the defence of illegality. And the Supreme Court agreed. They said that in this case, when we look back to those those same factors in Grondona, so um, the stultification point, the need for consistency between the civil and criminal law. Here, the criminal law would be undermined if her civil claim was allowed because she had a conviction and essentially the claim was based on that very conviction. So some of the, these heads of damage are damages for the punishment that the criminal law has imposed. Um, here, unlike in Grondona, they said that there was a close connection between the claimant's claim and the illegality because the, the claim is essentially founded in the illegality because it's, again, it's the claim for the consequences of that. Um, the gravity of the claimant's wrongdoing, obviously the extremely serious end, albeit diminished responsibility and the fact that, I mean, it is a tricky one because there was that agreement that it would not have happened at all um, had they not been negligent. But nevertheless, she had pleaded guilty um, and, and the civil law can't go behind, um, behind that plea. Um, also, the policy, the, com the competing public interests here, here there's a public interest in the proper allocation of NHS resources. Um, the fact that she intended to kill and do grievous bodily harm meant that there was a disparity in the party's respective wrongdoing. So their wrongdoing is negligence, she had admitted sufficient intention for um, a criminal conviction. So they concluded that it would not be disproportionate 
um, to deny her claim. And the claim failed. So hopefully you can see there the same factors being looked at, but how it applies differently in that different case. So the key differences here, centrality and those um, proportionality arguments. Um, so when you if you have a, a case where you're having to advise someone, look at those factors. Is it is it central? Is the illegality central? And what are the public policy um, arguments at stake?